the 42 Maple Art Podcast from the White Mountains of Northern New Hampshire. One of our favorite quotes is from Dr. Cesar A. Cruz at Harvard University, and it goes, Art should disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Comfort to you, comfort to you, we ain't got nothing to do with where you are. Oh, where you been, oh, where you going? Comfort to you, comfort to you, has got something to do with who you are. And high of love, and high of pain, and high of sorrow. On episode one of the 42 Maple Art Podcast, we're going to sit down and have a conversation with New Hampshire artist Trissa Tilson. She is an illustrative artist and a tattoo artist, and she currently has a show on display in the month of January 2018 in the gallery at 42 Maple, and the show is called Kevin, but you would never find a portrait of anybody called Kevin in the actual gallery right now. This show, Kevin, that you have on display, the titles of all of the pieces in the gallery tell a completely different story than the visuals that people are looking at. Would you say that this is a form of surrealism? The nice thing about surrealism is it doesn't have to make sense. I recall reading about Salvador Dali coming into an art talk in full scuba gear, nearly dying when he fell off the stage, and doing it all in the name of art. I just want to take a minute and read some of the, of the titles of some of the pieces that are in the gallery, um, because I feel like Kevin is somebody that we probably all know, or we can all relate to in one way or another. Is that the idea behind the titles of some of these pieces? Pretty much. I was kind of going for some weird things that don't necessarily happen in everyday life, but can still be kind of mundane. So you'd say that Kevin is a mundane guy with a mundane life? Yes. Here's a couple of the titles that actually cracked me up. Kevin gets a haircut and nobody notices. Tell me about that one. That was actually the first one that I came up with. I don't know why I kept thinking, uh, probably because I need a haircut. And I always think about how usually if somebody gets a haircut, I never notice until eight months later. I'm and such a dude. I know. Totally. Here's another one that, that amuses me greatly because I think I've experienced this one. Kevin steps in a puddle, has an existential crisis, and a wet sock. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> this one I love, Kevin goes on a blind date and is a little surprised by his date's passion for cheese. I, I, all I have to say about that is I really love cheese. I just feel like that is, you know, like, maybe not everybody has been on a blind date where somebody was passionate about cheese, but they've been on a blind date equally as awkward. Kevin takes a cooking class. To meet women, he discovers that the only people who take cooking classes in his area are men taking cooking classes to meet women. You started having a lot of fun with these titles once you got going, huh? I totally did. It, it was, you know, just a little story in my mind about some guy. That one actually came out of discussions with my husband about home ec in high school. And the only reason that the boys in high school would take home ec was to meet the girls? Exactly. Or find future wives that could sew and cook. But there were only boys in home ec. <laughs> I don't know. I never took home ec. Did you? Yes, in junior high. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't count in junior high. No, you're not really looking for a mate for life. I think I made my mom sew the stuffed animal we were so supposed to sew because I couldn't do it. <laughs> there so. you go. And then the last one that I want to read. Uh, while Kevin's car is in the shop, he gets a ride to work from the weird guy named Ted. Ted's car smells like McDonald's french fries and tears. <laughs> See, I mean, it's like you can't help but have this visceral response to these titles. And I think when, when the gallery was curated, nobody really expected these titles to go with your artwork. Your artwork doesn't look anything like 
what we've been talking about so far. Not at all. But it was kind of interesting at the art opening because people were trying to find reasons to connect the titles with the art. And in some instances, they were doing a pretty good job of it. I'm not entirely sure how, but they were making connections. So that's really good. I'm glad that you brought that up because that was something I wanted to talk about. You have a pretty strong opinion about inference with artwork. As an artist, you don't want to have to explain yourself or you don't want to make it really easy for people to find meaning in what they're looking at when they look at your art. Tell me a little bit about that. You find it a subjective experience for people? I think art is totally subjective and finding meaning in it should be subjective. I do have paintings that I have done that have meaning to me, but that meaning to me is a very personal thing. It usually has to do with moods or states of mind that I'm in at the time. And it might not be the same for other people because they're not in the same headspace as I am. So I, I like for people to find their own stories in my art. Well, I would certainly say that you gave people a challenge at your art opening with trying to find a Kevin in your pieces of work. Let's talk a little bit about the visuals that you work on. For anybody that hasn't seen your artwork, how would you describe the collection that's in the gallery? The simplest way I could describe it would be Audubon with a twist. I think that's an accurate representation. There's a lot of animals. I love animals, so I draw a lot of them. I love plants. Basically, I just draw the things I love or hate. I have a tendency to draw things I hate, too. Would you call yourself a painter or an illustrator? Honestly, I don't really think of myself as either. I just think of myself as a person who creates things. That whole art title has always kind of caught me up. How long did it take you to feel comfortable calling yourself an artist, even though you've been creating your whole life? Let's see, three years maybe? Really? Yes. And how did you get comfortable? Basically, since everybody else was calling me an artist, I was like, well, I guess that's my life now. And what was the struggle that you had with the term artist, even though you were creating prolifically? Well, I always figured artists are people who have to make money doing their art. It was a career, you know, not so much a passion or a drive. So that's kind of where I was at with it. I'm not an artist because I'm not selling my work. I'm just creating it for me. But, you know, things have changed. Why did you name this show Kevin, even though it, it has very much an Audubon feel to it? I really, really hate naming art shows. Why do you hate it? Every time I try to come up with a name for a show, it sounds very pretentious. Does that tie in in some way with your definition of the word artist or earning the title of calling yourself an artist? You know, I never really thought about it, but I think so. I think growing up in an art culture, sort of, I was a gallery kid, and I was always at art shows and art openings, and there's like, it's, it's like this whole class in and of itself, where there's the collectors, and there's the buyers, and then, and you just, it, it's like this whole world in and of itself that's, it seems kind of elite in some ways. Do you think it's really elite, or do you think it's perceived? You know, I think it's perceived, honestly. And I think a lot of people perceive it that way. I think art, pure art, is things that you need to get out, things that you love to get out. It's, it's not about making money. It's about doing what you're passionate about. I think there's two words in our language that are elusive when it comes to defining them. And one of them is love, and the other one is art. I agree. Asking artists to define art, I don't think you'll ever find two artists that have the same definition. Mm. Comfort to you, comfort to you, makes no difference with or without it, you know. You're gonna be, you're gonna be fine either way. Comfort to you. You've mentioned the word compulsion. A few times. 
Yes. Um, while we've been talking. So let's talk about um, compulsive art making and how that pertains to you. I am definitely a compulsive artist. And I don't create because I enjoy it, which is weird sounding. People are like, why would you create if you don't enjoy doing it? I do for the most part, but I don't do it solely because I enjoy it. I do it because I have to. Some people have artist blocks. Some people have writer's blocks. Very often in the creative process, you can hit walls in your development as a maker. What happens if, if, if you're an artist that's compelled to create and it's not necessarily always pleasurable for you, what happens when you hit one of those creative blocks? Mood swings. I get very irritable, snappy. My family steers clear until I have something on paper. And do you create every day? I do. Sometimes all day. And what was the longest art block you ever experienced? Four months. I drew, but it wasn't anything that I wanted to draw. It wasn't anything that I had in my head. It was just crappy little doodles or work-related things. But it was, it was a really rough year. <laughs> now, you would work primarily in watercolors, or you have been fairly recently. As typical with most artists, you've dabbled in a lot of different mediums and techniques. What is your earliest memory of creating art? I remember sitting at the kitchen table with pencils and I would draw these horrible horses. And they were all Appaloosas and they all looked more like lizards than horses and they had so much hair. And then the other, the other thing I remember is going to my grandma's house and she would have these big rolls of butcher paper and I'd sit at the card table and I'd start at one end of the roll, and I would draw and draw and pull the paper and draw and pull the paper and draw some more. And I would end up with, like, yards of drawings while watching PBS. I have a paper problem. I collect paper like some people collect shoes, baseball cards. If I have less than a ream of paper, I get nervous. <laughs> now, you're also a tattoo artist. Yes. How long have you been tattooing? Oh, about three years now. And what do you think, or, or how would you describe um, are the, if there are any similarities between illustrating in two dimensions and tattooing on people? There's some similarities. Just like any other sort of medium, it's got a learning curve to it. It took me a while to get over the no eraser, it's permanent thing, but I think that's actually helped me in my artistic career as well. I'm, I'm a lot less nervous with just putting stuff down on paper now. I'll just go for it, which is kind of the attitude you kind of need to have with tattooing too. Otherwise, you're going to make your clients nervous. <laughs> Are you given a lot of opportunities to create original artwork tattoos where it may not be true to form with the illustrative work that you do in watercolors and microns, but still, it, you know, if somebody says, hey, I want a bird, and you then have a certain amount of creative license to hand draw whatever kind of bird you want? Or, I mean, what is, what is the ratio of people that are bringing in Flash to somebody that has some faith in you as an artist? I'd say it's probably about 50-50, honestly, if it's not, like, my particular style. I do have quite a few clients who come in and want something drawn up, which is nice. We do get our fair share of people who like to pick their stuff off off the internet and that's great but I really really like to be able to draw stuff and the longer I have a client the more likely they are to have me hand draw something for them which is great. So you do have a few pieces of original Trissa Tilson artwork floating around on people's bodies on the planet right now. Yes. And are they like your illustrations in the gallery where it's a fusion of the beautiful and the macabre? Yes. I have one that was actually, when I apprenticed, it was a painting that I had up on my wall of a skull with some flowers and a little bit of fur and a little bit of guts. And the, the lady that I was practicing on asked if I would be willing to do that. And so I did. And she's walking around with that. And it's awesome. <laughs> I have another one. The lady said that she wanted something in my style. And she liked cats, and she liked skulls, and she liked flowers. So she got a cat, with human hands, of course, and wings, and I think maybe an extra eye. And it's perched on a bunch of skulls, and there's flowers scattered about. So, you know, those are really exciting to do. 
Because they're original? Yes, because that's the stuff I love to do. So walk on down that avenue desolate and dangerous truth where comfort cries in captured calm has... Let's talk a little bit about your particular style of illustrative artwork. You work in micron pens with watercolor and you're working in what, like 18 by 24? Anywhere between 9 by 12 and 18 by 24. And you are fusing. So so for anybody who hasn't seen your art, would you say that this is an accurate description? It's like Audubon meets death. Yeah. So it, it's it's very much very detailed, illustrative, like something you would see in botanical books. But there's very often animals that are exploding with their entrails coming out and, and honeybees buzzing around them. And, and so definitely a, a very uh, distinct balance between the beautiful and the macabre. Yes. And how do people react to that? You know, for the most part, I actually get pretty positive feedback. There are people who don't really know what to make of it. And then there's a few people who have just been kind of like, wow, you're kind of sick. How does that make you feel? Honestly, I don't really care. And does this go back to the fact that you make art for yourself? Exactly. And not for anyone else? You know, I make it for me. And at the end of the day, I'm the one who has to be happy with it or willing to put it up. Why are you compelled to put elements of death into your work um, in, such a, in such a prevalent way? Probably because I had a very, very early understanding of death as a child, and it's kind of always influenced me as a person. How you see the world? Yeah. And what were those early experiences with death? Well, my dad was the caretaker of a cemetery. We grew up in cemetery grounds. I'm pretty sure the house we lived in probably had bodies buried under it. He used to go pick up bodies in the hearse. I remember riding in the back of the hearse next to the body. You know, it's it's always been there. It's most Most kids are sheltered from that for some period of time. We had a pretty early understanding of what death was. Do you find it easier to accept that and come to terms with it in, in relation to yourself or loved ones because of being exposed to it so young? Or do you find that you still struggle with fear of mortality? Personally, I don't have fear of mortality. I mean, that's something that just has to happen at some point. It doesn't make it any easier when it's a loved one. I still have a hard time with that, which, you know, makes me human. <laughs> So you have a pretty practical understanding of the life-death cycle, would you say? Yeah. And you take that practical understanding and apply it to your artwork as a way to remind others to have a practical understanding of it? Or, you know, why, why do you combine the beautiful with the macabre? For me, I don't think it's, it's so much about death. I think it, it's more about how life is. It's not easy. It's not always beautiful. Ugly things happen to beautiful people. It's, it's just how it is, and it's more about balance than it is about death. Most people, I think at first glance, if they didn't understand who you are or how you make your art, would, would have a death reaction to what they see. Yeah. Um, and for you, it's, it's more about, it's more philosophical than that. Yep. It's a way to process difficulty? I think so. I, I have some paintings that I have done that have, like, touched on, you know, mental health, things like that, which, you know, somebody just glancing at my work wouldn't even know that. But that goes back to the whole it being a personal, it's a personal journey for me. So you don't feel like you have to explain it really to anybody, and, and their opinions don't influence what you create? No. That's a very strong position to be in. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of artists, you know, worry about how they would be perceived or they worry about if it would sell or they worry about, you know, what people will say when they see it or, and you're just way past all of that. You know, I've never really had too much of a problem worrying about what people think of me. Either, either can handle me or you can't. And is that also a product of your upbringing? Probably. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that probably has a little something to do with it. Name some of your favorite artists. Mm. 
Salvador Dali, H.R. Giger. There's a Dutch painter, Wienix. He was he did the, the Vanitas type paintings with the beautiful flowers and fruits and of course dead things. And what is Vanitas for people who don't know? Those are the they're like really dark backdrops, still lifes. And the still lifes they just glow like the flowers and the fruits. They're just absolute colors. They made me kinda wanna start learning oil painting is one of those things. <laughs> is that something that you're starting to explore now? Oil painting? Yes. You've tried it before. Oh, yeah. And you were frustrated by it. Yes. Why? Uh, I am an instant gratification kind of person. If I don't do well the first time around, I will quit. <laughs> At least for a little while. Um, I, had a, I had a hard time with the slowness of it and the patience. And I think now that I've had kids, I have a little more patience to deal with oil paints. <laughs> Yeah, kids will definitely give you patience. Some people would say that your artwork is similar to Lauren Marks. We're very similar. Very similar. There are differences, though, yeah. for anybody who knows her work. Um, that would be the best way to get some idea about what yours looks like if they haven't seen yours before. Yeah. Very, very detailed, very line-based illustrative watercolors. Yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of hers. When, when people say, oh, your art looks like like such and such or, you know, anything like that. I, I think about the few artists that I know that are out there that do, I, I guess you could call it gourmet art, and think there's literally dozens of us. <laughs> so what else influenced um, your attraction to gourmet art uh, besides growing up in a cemetery with a lot of death in your life? Steady stream of 80s horror movies, <laughs> probably. <laughs> You are a brave, brave child watching horror movies while living in a cemetery. The only one I, the only ones I ever had a problem with were zombie movies for obvious reasons. Obvious reasons, yes. <laughs> that makes sense. You started as a small child, always drawing. Were you? Do you think you, you were reflecting your world back to itself, or do you think that you were finding a way to communicate? Uh, yeah, I think I was probably finding a way to communicate. I'm very bad at communicating, and like I said before, I do express emotion through my art. Disguised as it may be, I, I definitely do that. So how many of your pieces, like you have maybe 25 pieces in the gallery right now, all named for Kevin, but having nothing to do with anyone named Kevin. Um, and all of these pieces are flora and fauna with the macabre and the beautiful, all um, very rich, color-saturated, detailed pieces. How many of those are autobiographical and have special meaning to you? I can think of at least three off the top of my head. Two are self-portraits, which I know sounds really weird, but they are. Would you say they're a self-portrait of your emotions? Yes. And it's funny because the actual titles of those pieces is my own worst enemy. Actually, I can think of another one that's out there. <laughs> I have a few that aren't hanging up currently that are autobiographical as well. And would you say that some of your artwork is inspired by mythology? Yes. Let's talk about that a little bit. What kind of mythologies are you inspired by or what particular cultures? I'm, I'm really big into Greek mythology. I always have been. I like Norse mythology. Welsh mythology is pretty cool too. But mostly, I, I always, I'm always drawn back to Greek mythology. It's very grand and romantic and tragic all at the same, all at the same time. I think maybe that's it, why it speaks to me. Is because it's it, it's very similar to how I feel about my artwork, actually. So describe how you feel about your artwork since since you brought that up. <laughs> Um, on a personal level, most of my pieces I actually hate. <laughs> really? Yes. That surprises me. Um, I think it's probably just because I spend so many hours staring at them that I get sick of them. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's not so much that you hate them because you're not pleased with how they've turned out, that you're just more tired of looking at them. Oh, no, I definitely have some like that, too. Really? Yeah. It's kind of one of those things. I'm, I'm very, very particular about how I want things to look when I do a piece and sometimes they don't turn out the way I want and sometimes I do the same drawing four or five times until it's the way I want. Do you do um, sketches or thumbnails in advance before you start creating a piece? Sometimes. Usually it's kind of one of those 
I'm just going to go as I go. And and that's also part of the tattooing, right? Yeah. But I've never really been really big on sketching out my ideas. I, I try. And it just... It, I'm I, it, My pieces generally kind of grow. I don't know if that makes sense. They just kind of evolve as I'm working at, on them. So honestly, if I have to start a piece over just because I think, oh, if I add this piece here or if, if this flows just slightly, it's not really a big deal to me because it's just a little bit closer to that vision I have in my head. And you're self-taught. You never went to art school or got any of that formal training or paid a lot of money for somebody to tell you what all the rules are. Nope. How do you feel about that? Are you glad that you didn't go to art school or do you kind of at some point regret not it going going to art school? It's kind of 50-50. I mean, I'm glad I, <laughs> glad I didn't spend the money. But at the same time, I think I missed out on things like learning how to network in the art world and stuff like that. So more the business of art. Yeah. That's per- that's about the only regret I have. I didn't do very well in high school art. I never really got along with my art teachers, so art school probably wasn't the best choice for me anyways. So you you are completely self-taught. Yes. How did you go about teaching yourself? Where did that start? A lot of trial and error. If I decide I want to try a new medium, I just try it. And if I like it, I keep going with it. How did you start teaching yourself things like contrast and tone and value and ratio and perspective, like those foundational things? How did you how did you start doing that? Just by drawing every single day, or did you did you like reference photographs? I like to reference photographs for for my animals, just so that I know what body parts look like. But things like tone and color and stuff like that, I don't actually even really think about it's just another one of those it kind of just happens as it happens <laughs> but it's not conscious for me what is it what is uh, the next direction we've talked about you've been doing watercolor and illustration uh, for quite a while now and you're just beginning to dabble in oil paints but most of your subject matter for the last probably five years has been this beautiful macabre where it's it's flesh and flowers it's exploding animals you know um, entwined with each other what's your next body of work going to look like you're, you're doing something based off of uh, some Japanese stuff, right? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to be doing a series of paintings that's not even remotely like anything I've been doing for the past several years, which is it's going to be a challenge because it's been a while since I've done people, and I've never done people in watercolor, and there's not going to be any lines, which kind of makes me a little nervous, but whatever. But it's... Uh, can, Kintsugi. I'm sorry if I completely butchered the uh, pronunciation of that. The Kintsugi? Yes. And what is Kintsugi for people who are listening? It's the practice of repairing broken pottery with gold, which is beautiful. Yeah, you know, they're, all the pictures I've seen of, of the repaired pieces are just amazing. And it's an art form in and of itself. And you're going to apply the concept of kintsugi, which is repairing broken pieces with gold, to people. Yes. Let's talk about that. Because <laughs> that sounds <clears throat> par for the course for you with uh, some really heavy-handed <laughs> philosophy tied into your artwork and all of your inner processes coming right into the paper. Yeah. Um, all, of the, all of the paintings are going to be um, very up-close pictures of bodies, I don't really know how else to describe it. Um, but like people it, interacting with each other yes, or it's all individual be, broken people? Uh, no, physical interaction between people. And then throughout is going to be threads of gold leaf. So you've done one. Yes. Describe that one. <laughs> it's, it's a small painting of a very up close of two lips, two, two people's lips. People kissing. Yes. 
Well, I guess that's kissing. One's kind of biting. Okay. But passionate couple. Yes. And but there's no there's no definition of the couple. Like it just the zoomed in of their lips. Yeah, it's pretty much just lips and teeth and maybe a little bit of chin and nose. <laughs> <laughs> Some people making out. <laughs> So, but then they have all this gold crack going through them. Yes. So that says something pretty profound. I mean, you know, having talked to you, knowing how philosophical your artwork can get, there's a lot of profundity in this, where you're talking about broken people coming together and interacting in physical ways, and then you're laying all those lines of broken pieces right there into the artwork Mm -hmm. um, through Kintsugi. And are you using gold leaf to do this? Uh, metal leaf? <laughs> yeah, okay. gold leaf is probably quite expensive. It's a little expensive. So let's talk about the philosophy of that, of uh, broken people and repairing patches and stitching it all back together with a little bit of sparkle. <laughs> well, I guess it kind of like goes back to that whole life's hard and it's rough and it's not always pretty and... Shit happens, and um, we get broken along the way. Everybody does. And I think when two people come together, they can kind of, you know, repair each other. Not necessarily making out, you know, but human interaction is a very important part of who we are as a species. We do a lot of interacting. That's changed in the last, what, 10, 20 years? Oh, yes. Definitely has. So do you think that you're trying to, in some way, address modern-day life with technology and and how that impacts people's ability to connect? Maybe a little bit. A lot of the times I'll go out and I'll see people standing next to each other and they're just staring down at their phones or their tablets or whatever. They're obviously somewhere together, but they're not together. They're not even interacting with each other. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe they're texting each other, but it's not real interaction. Do you feel like that that's a a detriment to us as a species? I think so. I mean, what, what what do they tell you is really, really important when you come home with a newborn child? Contact. I've seen those videos online where they when the, where they have the, the 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 babies and they're not interacting with them and you can see how it affects the baby. They wither away. Exactly. And I think that happens to us when we don't interact. And it's it's weird because we can be around people and connected to people, but we're also lonely. Do you think technology has made us more lonely? I think so. I mean, we're we're connected. And all at once, I mean, I can I can talk to people all day long for days and still never leave my house. Which is probably nice in some ways. Oh, yeah. You know, like Pantsless Friday or, you know, you don't really want to get out there. <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, you know, e- even even as an introvert, I'll start feeling it. Like, I'll start feeling, I'll get restless. And then... Well, like when my husband comes home from work, I'm like, yay, a person, <laughs> you know. So no matter how introverted you may be, you still need human connection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. You just kind of need it on your terms. <laughs> Smaller doses, maybe. did a series of uh, old men. Like this Kintsugi series that you're about to start is completely unlike anything people have been seeing from you uh, in recent times with the, the flesh and flowers and the beautiful macabre. And before that, you did a series of old men, which looks nothing like anything else you've ever done. Um, you know, like normally, you know, as an artist progresses, they kind of get this style or this canon, you know, this... You were, you've done enough work and somebody can look at like five pieces and know which ones belong to you. But this old man series that you did, what, maybe six years ago, I don't think that people would know it was yours unless you told them. No, I'm like the queen of 180s when it comes to art. Why is that? I think it's 
partially I want to learn it all. I want to be able to do something in every format, basically. Um, that was my brown colored pencil phase. So tell me about the, the Old Man series. Um, what, what launched that body of work? I went to a Gogo Bordello concert, which was probably one of like the best concerts I've ever gone to. Lots and lots of energy. And two of the musicians were just like these little gnarled old men, the accordion player and I believe the fiddle player. And they were just so, I don't know, they were really vivacious. and Not what you expect from old people? No. And then I was like, I want to draw them. I want to draw old people. I'm going to draw old people. So I drew old people for six months straight. And this old people series is old men and old women from a variety of cultures. Yes. And it's all done on uh, like craft paper, like, yep. a, like a sepia colored... Like brown butcher paper. Brown basically. butcher paper. And then you worked with... What was the medium that you were working uh, with? Brown and white Prismacolor pencils. And you started researching people from all over the world, right? Yes. So you're researching animals from all over the world. You've researched mythology from multiple cultures and time periods. And you've researched old people from the entire, every continent on the planet. <laughs> so there's, there's this under, underlying theme to what you're doing, which is, hey, I'm an introvert and I don't want to deal with the world, but I'm going to reflect everything I'm fascinated by yep. in the world. So it, it's, a, it's a way of nerding out, maybe? I am a huge nerd, I, I will admit. You are wearing a t-shirt with a kitten on the Empire State Building right now. And I've seen you in Bob Ross t-shirts, oh, too. Yeah, I have a nice... If it's not, if it's not Bob Ross, it's cats. <laughs> <laughs> so you have very much a global, a global approach to your work. Yes. Why? Um, I think the world is a really interesting place. I mean, I don't travel a lot. I did when I was younger. But... I think it goes back to the introvertedness. Um, I don't really like traveling, but I like to see what the world has to offer, which is one of the really nice things about the internet and the way that the world is today. I, I have that all at the touch of my fingers. So would you? Would you? Um, would it be fair to say that you have a love-hate relationship with technology? Yes. I think that's common for most of us. I think so. That have technology in our daily lives. It's convenient, but it's isolated. Exactly. Now, you also have been talking um, as we've been talking about your process as an artist or a creative or a maker, um, you've been talking about processing emotions, mm -hmm. you know, of difficult times that you go through or mental health issues, that life is not always pretty, um, and just keeping it very raw and very real. Um, does that reflect in your methodology? Does that reflect in how you make art? Oh, yes. Let's talk about that. <laughs> um, my art if you've ever seen it, is very precise and very controlled. Like, I am a complete control freak when it comes to my art. Like I said, I will throw away five paintings to get the one that I want. And I think that just, that, that happens because a lot of the times I don't feel like I am in control of my life. It's just like this crazy train ride that I'm on. And I do the art the way that I do so that I can feel some control. Sometimes it's a little hard to talk about. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, that basic concept of controlling one element of your life so completely because nothing else feels like it's in control. I mean, that's what is the foundation for eating disorders as well. Exactly. Anorexia nervosa, uh, bulimia, it's, it's an issue of control. So all things considered, I would think that creating exquisite art is a pretty healthy way to manage that loss of control sensation that you have. Most of the time, yes. <laughs> Sometimes not so much. <laughs> so when is it not? Um, I have a tendency to forget to eat. I will work for 12 hours straight without much of a break. Um, it, when I really get into a project, I have a tendency to isolate myself, which none of those are very healthy. Thankfully, I have people around to pull me out of myself when I need. If you are going through something difficult or something that you feel a complete loss of control, 
Is that when you are more inclined to pick up the uh, tools and start isolating yourself? Like, is that a reaction to life where you have to retreat and then make art? I think so, yes. I'm not I bet you also have to make art daily. Yes. <laughs> You're doing a lot of retreating. <laughs> I'm not a very confrontational person. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of my way of running away. But like I said, I do have people in my life who like to pull my ass out and, and get me going. So I'm very thankful for that. And you're a mother. Yes. You're a mother of two children, 10 and under. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and you're still able to make time to make this art. Do your children, how do you think your children are impacted by the artwork that they see when you're, when you're dealing with beauty and macabre? That's a good question. Um, my daughter loves it, but then again, she likes anything that's sparkly, and I put a lot of sparkles in my art. Honestly, they don't really talk to me very much about the gross part of it, which, you know, I don't know. But they do like the paintings that I do. They tell me that. They're like more into video games and YouTube anyways. <laughs> which is a product of modern society. Yes. Again, we're talking about technology. But your daughter is approaching five. Yeah. And she has her own art space. Yes. And you grew up in an artistic family. Mm -hmm. Do you think that being an artist is a byproduct of your environment, or do you think that it's genetic? Because you hear stories about, you hear stories about people who, there's not a single artist in the family. They come from a family of scientists or laymen, and then there's that one person who's constantly making art, and it's like, almost like the black sheep of the family, or, or maybe the colorful sheep of the family. <laughs> um, uh, you know, what's your, what's your philosophy on, on how artists are made, or if artists are made? I don't really know. I haven't put very much thought into it. I do think that if you're in an artistic family, you're more likely to be creative in some way. Genetics? I, maybe. Maybe there's, like, some crazy Crayola gene or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you inspired, um, you know, by the fact that there are other artists out there who are embracing the darker side of, of the human experience? I am. I mean, I've always been a fan of vulture culture anyways. What's vulture culture? <laughs> People who collect taxidermy or do taxidermy or skulls or oddities. Do you think that's a byproduct of being in an artistic family or is it a byproduct of growing up in a cemetery or do you think it's some like weird combination of all of the above? Uh, yeah, a little from column A, a little from column B. <laughs> what's behind door number one, exactly. what's behind door number two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the times as an artist we strive to be unique and not like anybody else. Do you think that's part of, is, is that part of the... Uh, the elitism that's uh, attached to the artistic world, or do you think it's ego-driven? Like, what do you think that's about? I think that's more, like, ego-driven. Yeah. Um, I've met some artists who are very ego-driven. They, they have very healthy egos. Oh, yeah. More so in the tattoo industry than in the, in the, in the painting world. Based on what you see on television about, you know, the tattoo world, is like, it seems to be this... A preconceived idea that you've got to have this cocky attitude of this big ego of being the best on the block in order to make it in the tattoo world. As a tattoo artist, what's your take on that? Uh, I think that a lot of people go into it thinking it's a rock star lifestyle. It is so far from the truth. And honestly, in my opinion, a little bit of humility goes a really long way. You'll have happier clients if, if you don't act. You'll have repeat customers, I'm sure. Yes. And it's like um, people in the tattoo world, if you work at a different shop than another person who's a tattoo artist, unless you're like way across the country, you can't be friends. It's very, so it's very competitive and cutthroat. It's very cutthroat. And I'm not, I'm not really a huge fan of the, the overall attitude. Do you think that's similar in, in fine art world too? Sometimes. Really? And so do you find, you know, because it's so competitive, more so than maybe like a, an office jockey job um, in both tattoo world and art world, because it's so competitive, do you ever find that there's a huge offset between somebody's ego and their skill set? <laughs> skill set? <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes people's shoes are a little bigger than their feet, right? Mm. I, don't, I don't see it very often 
like in because we live in a small kind of rural area. I don't see it very often up here, mostly because I think that the artists up here like to work together and do art stuff together. I think that's pretty cool in the art world because usually it's not like that. Exactly, it's usually quite competitive. So to have a to be in a rural environment that's collaborative. And also, you're not doing safe art, you know? Very often when you're in rural environments, people like safe things. They, they like to be in a safe part of the country where, where there's no urban city stuff or taxis or overwhelming overstimulus, you know? So these people, in, in very often, and maybe this is just a blanket statement, um, like the rural life because it's predictable and safe. And then you pop up and you live the rural life, but your art is far from predictable and far from safe. Maybe that's part of why I don't see a lot of snarkiness. Because people just don't know how to comprehend your stuff? or Because I don't do ducks on a pond. Is that what you call it? The safe art? Yes. Couch, um, the couch art. I like, couch I like to call it couch art. Lot, uh, I mean, I do ducks. but do, they're usually, do they have all their feet? They might have extra. Okay. And they might be hands, but whatever. Just because my art is so vastly different from what a lot of the artists up here do, I think I'm I'm a little shielded from any sort of art politics, which I'm totally fine with. There's definitely been a shift in the in the international art world. Um, you know, with the big, the high rollers and the big money, it the collectors aren't always collectors because they're passionate about art or wanting to support artists. These days, it's um, it, the the art of collecting has become its own show and tell. Yep. You know, where people are buying art as a status symbol to flaunt how much they spent on one piece by some artist as a sign of wealth or uh, a sign of elitism. So what, do you, what do you think about that? I find it shallow. I do too. It's, it's very, um, I don't know. I mean, most of the people who have ever bought my art have been people who genu- genuinely, I, I'm going to say all the people who have bought my art have been people who, who genuinely want it for the sake of having it. Really, it's, I, I don't know. I don't see the point in buying art if you're just what i got it's so expensive like a car yeah well status symbol but i guess it, it kind of cheapens the value i think of art you know but I, in, especially after talking to you because everything that you do has such a deeply philosophical ground to it the idea of cheapening it because it becomes a status symbol it's you know i wonder how some of these internationally acclaimed artists deal with it do you just get jaded and be like whatever it's a paycheck I mean, do you have to sell your soul? Like, Maybe they just start slapping single colors on an entire canvas and see who'll buy this today. Are you talking about Rothko? Maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> what is your take on artists like Rothko? Good on them for getting to where they are, but it makes it harder for us starving artists, I think, because then everybody wants that. In my opinion, it's not the kind of art I, I would like to buy. And certainly not from multiple millions of dollars, but, you know, the artists who get to that point, that's kind of what most artists strive to be. Well, here's a question for you. Do you think that getting to that level of status as an artist, an international celebrity, before you die, do you think that has as much to do with your talent as an artist and your skill set as an artist, or does it have more to do with your charisma, and or who you know? I definitely think it has to do with charisma and who you know. I mean, be honest. <laughs> I think it's a lot. It's, it's marketing that makes them smart business people. Very smart business people to get to that level. I personally think that that kind of status would be way too much pressure, and it would take some of the enjoyment out of creating for me. Like we said before, though, I'm not really in it to please other people. I'm in it to please me, or at least satisfy myself in some way. So that's really not something that's even in my radar. I don't know. I mean, I just, again, I think I'm revisiting the concept of, you know, how do you define art and what is an artist and who calls themselves artists? I think it's for those ongoing, since most of our dialogue has been pretty philosophical, it's another (laughs) philosophical take. 
I think so, you know, and I don't think it's up to any one person to define art. I think it's up to every ind individual person who views it, who creates it, who enjoys it. I think it's up to them to figure out what they see personally as art. I don't think it does us any good to argue about art because it's so subjective and it's so personal and it's so, so unique. Which is why you named a show Kevin and Kevin has existential crises and wet socks. Exactly. Or rides in cars that smell like french fries and tears. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You have just listened to the 42 Maple Art Podcast with your host, Angel Larkham. Be sure to visit 42maple.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic events at 42 Maple Contemporary Art Center. We'll see you at the next episode. Featured music in this podcast includes the song Comfort to You by Kala on the album Trinity and the song State of Mind by Audio Binger. It's also What If by Audio Binger. Oh, where you been? Oh, where you going? Comfort to you, comfort to you has got something to do with who you are and how you love and how you pain and how you sorrow.